All right, well, I'm so glad that you are here this morning to continue part four of our series, Not Too Far. If you're watching online, we're glad that you're joining us as well. Uh, my name is Matt, and I have the pleasure of serving as the lead pastor here. And we've been in this series uh, for the past four weeks, and we have been talking about just what that song just said, that you are not too far. No matter how far you've gone, he will go that much further to find you, to rescue you, to bring you back to where he desires for you to be. And if this is the first time that you've been here with us, maybe you know that you're far from God, you've been far from God, you may be like, man, that sounds crazy because when I think of God, I don't think of him as someone who would care enough about me or still have grace for me when I've drifted far from him. But that's absolutely the type of God that we have been seeing. That's what we've been discovering about God in this series. And so no matter where you are, no matter where you've been, if you walk through these doors this morning or you tuned in online today and you feel like you're far from God, then this message this morning is perfect for you because Jonah... The life of Jonah, documented in a short season of his life in the book of Jonah, has the power to change the whole direction of your life. Because throughout human history, since this happened with Jonah, the book of Jonah has been used by God to change the course of direction of people's lives who have been going away from him. Because when you read Jonah, Jonah really does serve as a mirror for our lives. When we read the book of Jonah, we see ourselves in it, which allows us to reevaluate ourselves in relationship to God. Jonah shows us who we are when we run from God and what God's response is, which is a great thing for us this morning. So if you've missed any part of this series, I just want you to know you can always go online and uh, catch up on any part of any of the sermons that you've missed. You can just go to hermanshills.com slash messages and find uh, those there. But just to catch you up on where we've been, I'm going to do a really quick recap. All right. Jonah is a prophet in Israel and a prophet is someone who their job is to hear from God and then deliver a message to the people of God of what God desires for them. God gives Jonah a message to go to a place called Nineveh. Jonah's like, I ain't going. He goes the other way and gets on a ship. He runs from God by going by sea to run from him by getting on a ship and going in the opposite direction that God wanted him to go and goes as far as he can before God sends a storm. God rouses the captain of the sailors to come to him and say, Jonah, what are you doing? Uh, and then, because the storm keeps the ship from going forward, uh, the, sh the sailors throw Jonah overboard because that's what Jonah tells them to do. And then the fish swallows Jonah. God sends a fish to swallow Jonah. And it looks like that that's punishment for Jonah, but it's actually his saving from drowning in the middle of the ocean, in the middle of this storm. And he's in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. And it's while he's in the belly of this fish that God disciplines Jonah. God works with Jonah and keeps him in an uncomfortable place until Jonah has a heart change. Because what God was all about with Jonah was a change of heart. Because Jonah didn't want to trust God, didn't want to obey God, didn't want to do what God wanted him to do in going to Nineveh. And so God wanted to change his heart. And so he allows him to be uncomfortable in the belly of this fish until his heart is indeed changed, which is what we see happened in chapter 2. So after Jonah has a change of heart, realizes that he should honor and obey God and do what God says, the fish we see at the end of chapter 2 vomits, it's very colorful language, vomits Jonah out onto dry land. And that's where we pick up today in Jonah chapter 3, starting in verse 1. And the two questions that we want to ask, really that we want to ask whenever you're reading through Jonah, is okay, what is now God going to do with Jonah? And what is Jonah's response going to be? What is God going to do, and what is Jonah's response going to be? What is God going to do now after Jonah has been disciplined, after Jonah has had a heart change, and he's been vomited onto dry land? Like, what is God going to do, and what is Jonah's response going to be? Well, first we're going to see what God is going to do after Jonah is vomited onto dry land. Chapter 3, starting in verse 1, here's what we read. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Now let's stop right there. 
How is God going to respond? God has already responded for the first two chapters with nothing but grace for Jonah. And then we get to chapter 3, verse 1, and we see it again. God still hasn't given up on him. Maybe Jonah was wondering, you know, I've been through all this and I've disobeyed God. I've run from God. I know that God saved me from drowning, but maybe my life as a prophet is over. Maybe God's not going to speak to me anymore. Maybe he's going to use somebody else. Maybe my time is done. But then in verse one of chapter three, the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. God gave Jonah a second chance. He came to Jonah and speaks to him Again, he's the God of second chances. And though this says here in verse, in verse 1, they came to Jonah a second time. This is in reference to the first time that he asked him to do something. Now he's coming to him a second time. But this is not limited uh, in how many times that God would come to you if he called you to do something. Right? The fact that this says second time refers to the second time in this story. But yes, God is the God of second chances, but he's the God of third chances and fourth chances and fifth chances and sixth chances. Man, if you're still breathing, if you're here this morning, if you're watching this morning, God has given you at least a second chance on something. If you're still alive this morning, God is giving you a second chance to be obedient to something that you were disobedient to yesterday. If you're still breathing, if you're still listening, if you're still awake, if you're still alive, there's something that God has asked you to do that you've likely not done. And if you're hearing it again, or if you're reading it again, or if you're alive and well, God's given you another opportunity. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. So what is the word that God is giving to Jonah this second time? We know that God spoke to Jonah a second time, but what is that word? Verse 2, go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. <laughs> now, this is the same message that God had given him in chapter 1 of verse 1 when Jonah ran away from God. So it's not just that God is giving him a second chance at being a prophet. It's not just that God is giving him a second chance at hearing his voice again. God is giving him a second chance at doing exactly what he called him to do in the first place that Jonah said no to. Like that's huge. But Jonah didn't see it necessarily as huge. We're going to see that again Next week. Next week, I'm telling you, is maybe the most important message of this whole series. And so don't miss next week. But what we know about Jonah is that he didn't want to go to Nineveh. It wasn't just him disobeying God and not wanting to do what God wanted him to do. It was that he didn't want to go to Nineveh because of Nineveh as well. And so there's a sense in which, man, he's probably glad that the word of God has come back to him, but he's hoping it's a different mission. But when he hears, go to Nineveh, he's likely thinking, okay, man, haven't you taken care of that by now, God? Like, I said no, I ran from you. You could have sent somebody else, right? Like, God, in fact, why didn't you send someone else is likely what Jonah's thinking. He's probably surprised. He's probably disappointed. But, but here's the important thing for us to realize this morning. When God desires for something to be a certain way, our disobedience or our running doesn't change what God desires. Like truth is truth whether we want it to be true or not. When God desires something to be a certain way, he will get what he desires in one way or another. And it may take three, four, or five times of him knocking you over the head to get through to you to do what he wants you to do. Right? And so God comes to Jonah a second time and says, hey, I'm going to give you the same message that I gave you in the first place. He says, I want you to go to Nineveh and proclaim to it the message that I gave you. I mean, Jonah, you shouldn't really have a problem with this because remember you had that heart change in the belly of the fish where you said, hey, salvation comes to the Lord. What I have vowed, I will make true. I, I, I'm going to sacrifice before you. And so Jonah, so you're there. And God asks him, the word of the Lord comes to Jonah a second time, go to the great city of Nineveh and give it the message that I give you. And you know what I love about God in this verse is what he doesn't say. <laughs> he doesn't bring up the past. He doesn't say, 
you know, you better do this because you saw what happened last time. He doesn't say, hey, Jonah, you've already been a failure once. You don't want to be a failure again. He just brings him the same message that he brought to him the first time. And he doesn't bring up the past because God isn't as concerned with the past as he is with the future. He isn't as concerned with Jonah's past failures as he is with Jonah moving forward with what he's asking him to do. That in and of itself should have meant a lot to Jonah. And it should mean a lot to you too. That if the book of Jonah is to serve as a mirror for our life, might it be that the God of Jonah is the same God of all of us and that no matter how far you've run, no matter how many times you've said no or you've disobeyed, that when God comes to you and gives you a second chance, he's not bringing up your past, he's showing you the future and saying, this is what I'm calling you to do. So what will Jonah do? (laughs) He gets the message, he got it the first time he ran, spent three days and three nights in a fish, and then God comes back to him and says, I want you to go to Nineveh, look at the first part of verse three that'll be on the screen here. I want you to see this. Verse three, he gets it. And Jonah, verse three we see, obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Like that is the biggest not surprise in any part of the Bible, right? Like, I mean, there's no, it would have not been a spoiler if I would have asked you what do you think is going to happen because of course he did that, right? I mean, he's not dumb. He doesn't want to go back through what he had to go through before with the storms and the sailors and being thrown into the sea and being swallowed by a whale or or a fish and being in the belly of that fish for three days and three nights. I mean, he's willing and ready to obey this time. Or maybe, and again, we'll see this next week, maybe he just wants to avoid the consequences of disobedience more than he's excited to obey God. We'll see again that a little bit next week. But something of note, Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now listen, it wasn't a quick journey to Nineveh. Let's just assume that he got spit up on land where he departed. Let's assume he's in Joppa, which is where he originally boarded the ship to go to Tarshish, which was about 2,000, 2,500 miles away from Joppa. Joppa to Nineveh was about five to 550 miles away. And so I don't know exactly how Jonah got to Nineveh, but by he went to Nineveh, he didn't get there in a couple hours. All right? They didn't have Ubers back then. All right? They didn't have planes and trains. He would have gone by camel or carriage, or he would have walked to get to Nineveh. And the journey from Joppa to Nineveh was not a pleasant one, was not an easy one. It would have taken him at least four weeks, five weeks, at least a month to get to Nineveh. And so it was a trip to get there. So let's assume that he went immediately after we read in verse 3, he obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. It still takes him a little bit of time to get there. But what happens once he gets there, we're told that Nineveh was a very large city and that it took three days to go through it. It was a large city. It would have been much larger than the city that Jonah grew up in, much larger than any city in Israel. We we know that it had at least a population of 120,000 people. And it took him three days to go through it, though, not because it was such a big city and to walk through it, it would take that long, but to get the message that God had told him to give the Ninevites, it took him that long to get the message throughout the city. Because Nineveh had gates, and the palace, and the temple courtyards, and the public places, and there was no social media to get the message to spread virally. You had to physically walk around and tell people the message. And isn't it interesting, I just just think these things are interesting, that the number of days that it took Jonah to give the message are the same number of days that he was in the belly of the fish. Three days. Verse 4, Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming, and here's his message, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. That's his message. 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. 40 more days and then it's over for you. There will be consequences for how you're living, if you will. It's a simple message, but it's straightforward. And notice, it isn't overtly colorful, like, hey, y'all have done a lot of bad things, 
Y'all have been evil people, and so if y'all don't repent, if y'all don't turn, it's over for you. Like, Jonah doesn't give any of those details. It's simply this. 40 more days and your city will be overthrown. It's a very simple and straightforward message. There's no, this is interesting. There's no explanation of, and if you don't, let me tell you what happened to me. You don't want to go through that. There's no, hey, if you repent, God will relent. There's no, hey, I've noticed that God is a God of grace, and so I bet if you just give him your heart that he won't do this. There's no warning. There's no compassion. It's just a straightforward, simple, seems almost as if dismissive message from Jonah. 40 more days, and the city will be overthrown. Let's see what happens next. The Ninevites believed God, verse 5. A fast was proclaimed, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. Is that, now, now here, is that not amazing? Again, the Ninevites and the Israelites are enemies, and an Israelite comes to Nineveh and shares with them that this is going to happen, and they believe him. Like, they don't ask questions. They don't push back. They don't ask for proof. They just believe why do, why do they believe? Isn't that interesting? Like, they just believe. They're like, okay, if this is what you said, we're just going to believe. You know, one, there's, there's multiple explanations as to why. Maybe they believed because the Ninevites and the Assyrians were pagan god worshipers. And so to worship all of their regional pagan gods, they would all have different ideas of what gods they were worshiping. And they knew that you couldn't incite the gods and really discern why they were doing certain things. And so they had all these superstitions as to why they would receive these messages. And so maybe they thought, okay, this is just another message from a God that we worship that you have sent an Israelite to us. And so we're going to believe it. Another is that maybe they had never seen anybody that looked like Jonah. Because there's lots of people that will say, hey, if you spend three days and three nights in the belly of a fish, the gastric juices will bleach your skin and make you look kind of different. And so maybe they saw him and they're like, wow, we've never seen anybody like you, so we're going to trust what you're saying, right? Maybe um, there's some that argue that there was a legend circulating that came before Jonah. And it was this story about a fish man, a guy that had lived in a fish for a few days and then lived. And so they realized, man, you're that guy. We're going to listen to you. Maybe it's because they were weak as a nation. Assyria was in a time of weakness. And so they knew that, man, if there's a threat to us, we don't know what nation this could be coming from. We need to take this seriously. And so they, they responded in that way. Maybe there had been a recent earthquake and a lot of times they had superstitions and omens that would say, well, okay, if there's a prophet that comes after. Again, we don't know exactly why they responded this way other than, here's what we do know. <clears throat> we know that God used these few words that Jonah gave to get their attention. And that these few words, even if diluted by Jonah's attitude towards the Ninevites, as a prophet, here's what we know. The words that he delivered were to be seen as if God were speaking through him. And what we know is that a few words delivered by a prophet of God to people is more powerful than a thousand eloquent words than any of us could say. And it's more powerful than anything that we could try to line up to explain why the Ninevites would have responded in that way. The best explanation is simply because God spoke to them through this prophet that that's why they responded in that way. Because God had spoken to them. How do we know that God spoke to them? Look again at verse five. The Ninevites, it doesn't say believed Jonah. It says the Ninevites believed God. Isn't that interesting that they believed God when Jonah's message to them was devoid of God? He didn't say anything about God, didn't say anything about what they should do in response to this message. He just said, hey, 40 more days, and hey, peace out. Y'all are going to be peace out. I'm out, right? He just gives them a short, sweet message that's not very sweet, but he just moved on. But through his message, they believe that God is the one behind this. And they don't only believe God, but they put on sackcloth. 
and they fast. They don't eat. And if you're not eating, you're praying. So they're fasting. They're praying. They put on sackcloth. And what is sackcloth? Sackcloth is simply a sign of mourning that people would do whenever they were going through a, a dark season of mourning or going through a season of fasting. And it's a sign of humility and repentance. And this sackcloth was uncomfortable as a garment. It was likely made of, of goat's hair. And so they would put it on to show that they're, they're humble and that they're mourning and that they're trying to go through a season of repentance. And, and, and they're humbling themselves before God. That's what the people that he encountered, that he tells us in verse 5, were doing. Look at verse 6. When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh. Again, he got through the whole city. Reached the king of Nineveh. <clears throat> he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. And this is the proclamation he issued in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. So what's happened? They put on sackcloth, an uncomfortable garment to show their heart change. They've turned from their evil ways. They're no longer doing the evil that they were doing. They're praying to God. They respond to God by order of the king. But by giving up their evil ways, we saw this last week when Jonah was in the belly of the fish. When you give up sin, when you give up evil, that's called repentance. And so what these people do, the Ninevites, because of one word from God, they turn and stop doing what they were doing. Do you see what's so obvious? It's been obvious throughout this series, every message. The person, the prophet of God, who should respond positively to God when God asks him to do something, runs. And the person or the people who are far from God, when they hear the word from God, they turn and run right to where God desires for them to go. The Ninevites were evil. They were doing unthinkable evils. And God saw that and didn't look on it favorably and said, man, something needs to be done about these people to which the Israelites and Jonah are like, absolutely, we agree. Something needs to be done. And so they come with this message, Jonah does, and gives this message to these people. And their response is exactly the response that all of us are offered, that all of us has the opportunity to do when we've been far from God. It's to repent and turn back to God. The Ninevites said, hey, let's just all pray to God. Let's repent of our evil ways, let's change, let's, let's, let's commit to God. And why did they do all that? Look at verse 9. Who knows, the king said, God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. Now this is interesting because what this shows us is that Jonah had not included that in his message. Because if Jonah had included that in his message, hey, if y'all will repent, if you will turn, if you will relent from your evil ways, God is a compassionate and gracious God. Let me tell you about what he did for me. I ran from him and I thought he was going to kill me, but he saved me. Man, if he's done that for me, he'll be that for you. No, Jonah doesn't give that message. How do we know that? Because they are just presupposing and hoping and wishing and praying that maybe if we do this and show God that we've turned our hearts, maybe he'll relent. Maybe he'll be compassionate. And guess what? That's exactly what God did. Look at verse 10. When God saw what they did, that is the Ninevites, and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction that he had threatened.
a whole nation that God had proclaimed judgment was coming to because they deserved it. Here's a message from a prophet who's run from God. A simple message that, hey, destruction is coming your way. He doesn't even explain how they could avoid it, but they receive that message and they decide we're going to go on this God being gracious and we're going to turn and repent because we recognize now our evil ways. And the God of Jonah (laughs) is revered and respected and now worshipped by the Ninevites. And I just, I just want us to, to pause a second and just to think about this historically, but also for your life to see how history can intersect the present. What we see in chapter three is that God is a God of second chances. He's not just a God of second chances for people in the past, but he's a God of second chances for people in the present. And we can understand that he's a God of second chances for us in the present by looking at the past and seeing what he's done for people in the past and how he's been there for them. But there's two takeaways about God being a God of second chances that I want us to look at this morning. First, it's right here in verse 10 with the Ninevites, all right? I want you to look again at verse 10, and I want you to see what God saw. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. God responded to what he saw in the Ninevites. He didn't respond because they said, oh God, I'm sorry. Oh God, why don't you just overlook this? No, no. He responded with grace in response to their hearts being turned towards him. It's not that they earned his grace, because you cannot earn grace. Grace is getting something that's good that you don't deserve. It's not that they earned his grace, but it's that by their actions, they revealed that they had had a true heart change. It's by their actions they revealed that their heart had truly changed. And see, so often we go through life, so often, if you've talked to people, if you've been that person, we've all been that person at one time or another, where what has happened is we've said, well, man, I'm sorry for that, but then we go on and we live as if we weren't really sorry, right? When the truth is, to sh- you show what you believe, and I say this all the time around here, you show what you believe, not by what you say you believe, Peep talk is cheap. You show what you believe not by what you say, but by what you do. And God here responded to their action, not because they had to earn it, but because their actions revealed (laughs) that they truly had a repentant and a remorseful heart. And so this morning, I just I just want to challenge us this morning. Maybe you can relate to the Ninevites. In the sense that you know you've been far from God, but maybe you've gone to church in the past and you, you've come in and you've just said a prayer and you're like, well why, well, why hasn't my heart changed or why does my life still look the same? Maybe it's because you've never truly repented before God. You've never truly thrown your heart on the floor and said, God, I lay my life out before you and I just want you to know that I am so sorry. And it's not just that I know I'm sorry. I'm not just agreeing with you that what I've been doing is wrong, but it's I am committed to going in the opposite direction. And hey, I'm going to mess up because I'm not perfect. And so there's going to be times when I'm going to come back to the wayside. But God, my desire is to come with you and to walk in the direction that you would have me to go. That was what the Ninevites did. That was the opposite of what Jonah did for almost two full chapters until we get to the last couple verses. Repentance, turning, giving your heart to God is not just saying, okay, I agree with you, God, about what I did is wrong. That's confession. Repentance is saying, I don't only agree with you, but God, I'm going to turn and go in the direction that you would have me to go. That's what the Ninevites did. And, if, and here's, here's the good news. Here's the good news. No matter how many times you've sat in church, no matter how many times you've gone through life, 
and you've known something you're supposed to do and you've gone the opposite direction, if you're still breathing, if you're hearing this message right now, it's not too late for you. God is a God of second chances, even for you right now. Like no matter how hardened your heart has been, no matter how much you've gone through the motions, no matter how much you haven't given your life to him, you don't have to go through the motions anymore. He's a God of second chances even for those who have never fully surrendered. But second, second, here's the second thing I want you to see. God is not just the God of second chances for the Ninevites. God is not just the God of second chances for the Jonas who feel like they've been far from God and now they realize, oh my goodness, you're a gracious God who will receive me back into relationship with you. That is all true. But I want you to see something, and it's simply this, that God is the God of second chances for wanting to use you. And I don't mean use you like maybe you've been used in relationships or, or by an employer or, or something like that. I mean use you by being able to use you to make a difference in the world. Amen. We were all created by the God of the universe. And we find our purpose when we're a part of something bigger than ourselves. And we are a part of being used by God to do something great in the world. No matter how small and insignificant it might seem. And I want you to see something. God did not bring up Jonah's past when he gave him his second mission. It was the same mission for the second time. God just gave it to him. And I think a lot of times what happens to people is because we've screwed up in the past and we've all screwed up, because we've made mistakes in the past, we've all made mistakes, we allow the guilt and the shame of past failures to hold us down and hold us back from what God wants for us. And guilt and shame is not of God. It's of the enemy of God who wants to keep you from God using you. And if he can keep you in a place of thinking that, well, because of what I've done in the past and because of my disobedience and because of my mistakes and because of my running, well, God can never use me. That's exactly where he wants you. The enemy of God would want nothing more than for you to come to church every Sunday and sit in this seat and think, oh man, that was a good message and that was a good song and man, I really enjoyed that, but I'm not gonna do anything with it because well, God is obviously done with me because he can't use me because of what I've done in the past. I'm damaged goods or hey, I've made a mistake and so I might as well just continue that mistake and that train of life because why would I turn? Because if I've done that once, then it, it's over for me. And that's so far from God's vision for your life and that flies in the face of what we just saw in Jonah chapter 3, verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. He didn't say, hey, I'm only going to use you if you now do this. He didn't say, hey, there's conditions and exceptions to me using you. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Now, God, I do believe, no matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, no matter how far you've run, he wants to use you now. He comes to you, I believe now, if you're here and you're hearing this message. And like even me, yes, I believe even you and I don't even know all of your stories. Now, he choosing to use you may look different than it looked in the past. For Jonah, it was the same calling, but for you it may look different because there are times when the second chances that God brings to us are in a different field than previously because it needs to be for the sake of him using you or for the sake of your own temptation or for the sake of others that you're going to be impacting. To go back to the same area that he originally called you to may be a distraction. But make no mistake, regardless of where he is calling you and what it is that he wants to use you for, he wants to use you for something. He wants to make a difference in others' lives through your life. And I promise you there's people with much more colorful pasts than you have that God has used. And so don't allow shame or guilt to stand in the way of God using you. Let God determine how he wants to use you. But make no mistake, he wants to still use you. 
We've all been given certain gifts and talents and skills that God desires for you to use for him. He can use your giving. He can use your serving. He can use your gifts. He can use your vocation to impact others, if you will, let him. You don't have to live your life in neutral for the rest of your life because there's been a season of your life where you ran from God. You can give your life to him and allow him to redirect it with a second chance, which is what he wants you to do. Amen. The power of God using you does not lie in you living a perfect life or being free of screw-ups in your life. That just means you're a perfect candidate for God to use because the power of him using you was never dependent on your perfection anyway. It was always dependent on his power. God used Jonah to give a message to the Ninevites that spared their lives and Jonah didn't even give it with any compassion. He just gave a few words and look what happened. Because it wasn't about Jonah. It was always about God. And if God wants to use you, he can. And so this morning, I just want to pray for us, and then we're going to sing one final song. And I, I, I want to pray for all of us in the room and those watching online that this morning, with a message like this, may find themselves in one of two camps. Like the Ninevites, who were far from God and thought they had no hope, and their only hope was repenting and giving their heart to Christ and seeing if he would be gracious to them, and he was, or the Jonas, who wonder if God really is a God, not just of second chances when it comes to my relationship with him, but second chances in him using me in a powerful way.